by Ronit Selina here from selinashapland.com. And today I'm very excited because I have Joanna Penn, New York Times and US Today best-selling thriller author, entrepreneur, and the host of the Creative Pen podcast with me. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Selina. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, I'm pretty excited to have you here. I- I thought we'd just jump straight in. Could I ask you a few questions about how you came to your writing career? If you could tell us a little bit more about you as well. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, well, I I have a degree in theology, which, of course, is completely useless, but does actually now come into my thrillers. Um, After doing, you know, theology, I went into consulting, business consulting. As you do, you have to get a job out of uni, and um, I ended up doing that for 13 years. It's just one of those typical things, you know, you start doing a job to pay the bills, and 13 years later, you're like, how did I end up at this point? (laughs) Yeah, you know what I mean? And um, at that point, I was actually... Um, I was living in Australia, in Brisbane, um, and uh, I, I had been living in New Zealand. I'm British, obviously, and I tried loads of things. I tried leaving my job, doing different businesses, always ended up going back to this business consultancy job. And uh, to, to, to tell you how boring it was, I used to implement accounts payable into large corporates, so, you know, the, the billing department, um, seriously. And You know, the well-paid job, respected or career, all of that. And I just wasn't happy. I was kind of creatively stunted and spiritually kind of dead because of what I was doing in my day job. And I was like, what is wrong? So I started writing. You know, I've always been a writer. I've got lots of journals and all that, but I'd never tried to write a book. And I was reading a lot of self-help books and just decided to write my own self-help book um, in the hope that it would help me, but also help other people. So that first book was called How to Enjoy Your Job or find a new one because you know essentially I was like why don't I like this and why are so many other people miserable in their jobs and um, I actually rewrote that book a couple of years ago it's now called career change which is a much better title by the way Um, and then that basically started me on the journey so uh, I learned how to self-publish and I started my site thecreativepen.com pen with a double n and I started my own podcast in 2009 and then I started writing fiction and kind of fast forward you know 2015 um I left my well I left my job in uh, September 2011 to become a full-time author I was making enough money and yeah now I have run a, a six-figure business writing thrillers and also uh, teaching other people how to self-publish so it's been quite a journey I guess I mean it's almost 10 years now since I yeah. started on this this path basically but it's amazing what how your life can change in that amount of time yeah it's a relatively short period of time in some some ways being 10 years um so i just i'd really like you to let us know what really inspired you to become a thriller fiction author yes specifically um well i think it's very important when you're writing fiction to write what you love to read and when I was miserable in my job um, I'm particularly a member in Brisbane because uh, you know, I've really got to the point of being you know not enjoying it and I used to go down to um, the bookstore at lunchtime and the books I always wanted to read were action adventure thrillers you know romps around the world finding mysterious objects and solving mysteries and having fights and I love explosion movies like Con Air and stuff like that you know I really that's the type of stuff I like for fun and it's escape Um, And this is the most popular fiction is about escape. So thrillers are about, you know, risk and escaping into this high octane world. And romance is about escaping into a happily ever after. Um, Sci-fi is about, you know, escaping into space. And so these are the things that people use to escape the misery of their immediate life. Um, And that's so when I started to write fiction, I was always going to write what I love to read, which is the, you know, these sort of action adventure thrillers and like I like the paranormal stuff too so I have quite a lot of supernatural stuff um and I would really suggest that you know write what you love to read and like for example romance is an amazing genre but I don't read romance so I I respect romance readers and writers too much to do that without understanding it so um so yeah 
but your your stories have a uh, like a romance uh, subplot in some ways in, in that. Uh, well, well, not romance, no, is it exactly? Sexual tension. The, ah, there you go. <laughs> That's the right waiting for it. Yeah, it, it's um, it's called uh, un- unresolved sexual tension. Um, this is this is a technique used in genres that are not very definitely not romance. The, the definition of romance is that they end up together at the um, end. Yes. <laughs> These these are important points, but no, I like a bit of sexual tension. But the thing is, once they actually get together, and you see it in TV series like Castle and Bones, you know, I love those series, the early series, and then they get together and it's like, yeah, that's enough. Yeah, boring. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you actually transition from that full-time job into being a successfully successful published thriller author? Uh, Well, I, I, once I started that first book I started a website I had really had no plan to leave my job well I wanted to leave my job but I didn't really know how a blog or books could do that at that point and this was before the Kindle originally back in 2007 um and then the Kindle started happening and I started seeing the business opportunities with books uh I also started loving it like I think if you write a book and you love it you get the bug and you carry on um so I I just carried on and then you know my husband was brilliant about it he was like if you love doing this then just spend all your time on it that you can and so I was working my job but I'd get up in the mornings and write before work I was in the in lunch in the lunch times I would be doing stuff on social media I was mainlining podcasts and audio programs learning about internet business and marketing and all that because I've never had any education in marketing for example um and learning how to do all this stuff as you know like setting up a podcast feed all all these little technical things that nobody teaches you um so I started to do all of that part you know I say part time in the mornings evenings weekends every spare moment because I could see that I could get out of my job but it would take a lot of effort and I had to learn all this new stuff so I, I basically spent three and a half years Uh, in every spare moment uh, learning the business and by the time I left my job I was making uh, enough money that we could do six months so I said to my husband okay I've saved this amount of money you know my share of all the bills and stuff and um, you know in six months time if this isn't working I'll go back to my job Mm -hmm. and I never went back to my job basically and year on year the income has just gone up and the reason why just to so people understand is this business is scalable so you create a book or an online course or something you can sell it once or you can sell it a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times. So I've now got 15 books. I've got, you know, courses. I've got, you know, lots of things. Now, each of these can sell in different formats, in different countries, you know, in different languages. And you end up having like 150 streams of income. And it's absolutely crazy. So once the penny drops around the business model of intellectual property, you can see how you could end up earning far more money from it than you ever can uh, selling your time. And essentially, any day job is selling your time to somebody else (laughs) and building their business. Mm. So, yeah, so basically, to be more concrete, I saved six months amount of money Mm. so that there was a buffer. I worked for three and a half years before leaving my job to build up an income and I was already making money when I left my job. Um, And I pretty much just gave up on doing anything else during that time when I was building the business. What was it like to finally earn some income from your writing to see that change happen? Was that... Yeah. I mean, I think it's magic, and I, I very much encourage people to do this. Um, I've got this um, series of free videos um, that people can have a look at, the creativepen.com forward slash freedom. And in one of those videos, I'm like, the, what you have to do is earn that first $10. Yeah. <laughs> so because if you can earn $10, and to earn $10, all you need to do is, or I say all you need to do <laughs> is, you know, write a good book, mm. put it up on Amazon, and you will earn ten dollars. You will get ten dollars. You know that's if a, a two ninety nine ebook you sell five copies. Okay, if you can make ten dollars, you can make a hundred dollars. And if you can make a hundred, you can make a thousand. And once you've made a thousand a month, you can be looking at ten thousand a month, right? Mm. Then can you see how yeah. actually the process is no different? It's just about scaling. Mm. So I would urge uh, for me. I, see, I was trying to. I wish I'd saved a screenshot or something, but. 
when I realized that I could make money that wasn't related to somebody paying me a paycheck, mm. I like the whole world shifted. Mm. It was like, oh my goodness, for someone who's so obsessed with independence as I am, this was a big, big deal. And I just kind of went after that. Um, and I, I started doing courses. As soon, you know, as soon as I learned anything, I started selling my um, knowledge back to people about self-publishing, that type of thing. And uh, I still do that. And, you know, teaching people online is a really another really good way to make money mm. i know i've uh, i've done a couple of your courses too i really enjoyed mm. the the plotting your novel i think it was um, with you and ros and that was yeah was with ros yeah well amazing. and i'm about it's funny because I've, I've retired those courses now and i'm about to start doing a whole load more um you know kind of taking it all further but no but this is and this is the thing is you know over the years as you learn more you you know you want to teach where you are now and yes. you know I've just finished my um tenth book my tenth fiction book so you know I feel like I've got so much more to share now. <laughs> yes, well for somebody who's just in that process of learning the plotting and all of that type of stuff, it's like it's it's exciting and it's also like is it ever going to happen kind of feeling sometimes when you're sitting there and you're you're on your own with your world but you're just wondering mm. am I ever going to finish this. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, my number one tip there is to uh, set a deadline. Mm. And for my first book, um, I did um, the year of the novel at the Queensland's Library uh, in Brisbane. And what's so good about having a year is that you're like, okay, a year. And at the beginning you feel like, yeah, okay, I've got a year, it's all good, you know. And then you start realising that the year is going past really quickly. But in that year, the teacher said to me, I'll never forget it, she said uh, at the beginning of the year, out of the class of 30 of you, only one of you will finish wow. in a year. And I'm sitting there going, that's me, that's definitely me. And, of course, it was me. <laughs> because, I, you know, I was, like, hardcore about it. And that's what you have to do, set a deadline and then actually hit the deadline. Mm-hmm. Um, and break that deadline down into weeks. So I have in my diary now um, the day I will start writing the next book. And for four weeks, the blocks of writing, you know, actually schedule it like you schedule, like we scheduled this meeting, you know, schedule the blocks of writing and say, okay, in that time I will write 500 words. And, you know, and if I count up the number of blocks in my diary, I will have 50,000 words and then I will book an editor. Right. Okay. And, yeah, just like break it down, set the deadlines and be really hardcore. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I'd love to know when you decide, I know you love to read thrillers, but uh, I believe that you started with nonfiction and education as a part of uh, your business plan. At what point did you really go, no, I really want to write thrillers. I want to do fiction well, I mean, I still do both, and I'll always do both, I think, because I, I really enjoy nonfiction too. But um, I, it was because I had the creative pen, the blog, and I was, you know, I was starting to build an audience. It was about a year and a half into having the, the site, and I had the podcast, and I had a guest on the podcast, Tom Evans, uh, the book right, and it was about writer's blocks. And I was like, I don't have writer's block. It's, I don't believe in writer's block. And, um, you know, he said, well, why, why aren't you writing fiction? And I was like, oh, well, I don't write fiction. That's not me. I'm not whatever. And he's like, yeah, it sounds like a block to me. <laughs> like, if you don't think you're creative enough to write fiction, that sounds like a block. And I was like, oh, yeah, I think, okay, I take that point. And that kind of changed my mindset. And then I did NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, um, in, no, in that November Oh, I think that was 2009, and then I did the year of the novel in 2010, and then I published the book in April 2011. Wow. So it was essentially changed, you know, change the mindset, do the work, publish the book, and get on with it. Yeah. And so it was. It, I think it was more that you know, I had the accountability of the podcast and the blog. And the fact is, I was built. You know, I had a writer's blog. I still have a writer's blog or blog for writers, and if I don't try things myself and I don't stay accountable, then I don't think I'm doing a good enough job. I, I get very annoyed when people talk about things they don't actually do themselves. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like, if I'm going to talk about this, I have to do it myself first. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. I think it um, gives you far more credibility that, you know, 
certainly that's why there's so many people who listen. <laughs> well, no, no, it's lovely of you to say. And uh, I mean, I would urge any, you know, anybody, you mean, only listen to people who are actually, actually have skin in the game. Mm-hmm. That's what I, you call it. Like, be very careful how people make their money. So, for example, you know, you'll see these free things online, um, you know, 15 ways to use social media to build your business. And the person who's written that um, actually works for a company like Buffer, they're they are paid based on a salary. They're not paid based on using social media to actually make money in their business. And um, and also, I mean, like even looking at the teachers. So the teacher at um, the Queensland Library. And it's funny looking back now. The lady who actually taught me about writing a novel doesn't make a living as an author, and she still doesn't. I've, I've looked um, she, as a literary fiction author. She makes a living, um, you know. Uh, teaching creative writing and now actually does something completely different so when evaluating advice you know have a look at how people are actually making a living and you know and check up on that rather than just accepting what people say yeah I noticed for myself over the time that I've because I first found the creative pen on YouTube actually and uh, because I was like how do I find something that teaches me about the game of writing how, how do I mm. transition out of a day job into something and and that's when I found the creative pen and and since then I've noticed a, a pattern happening where I am looking into the background and the the credibility of the people speaking whereas before it was like oh you could say anything to me I kind of believe it at first and it's like you learn you learn through experience don't you so, oh, you do. Yeah. So can you tell us more about the two, at, at the moment, your two uh, thriller series, the Arcane Thrillers and your London Psychic Crime Thrillers? Yeah, sure. So um, the Arcane series is action-adventure thriller, um, and basically the Arcane is a secret, a British secret agency that's under Trafalgar Square in London, and they investigate supernatural mysteries around the world. And uh, there's Morgan Sierra, who's like my alter ego, <laughs> who gets to kind of run around the world kicking ass and, um, you know, uh, saving the world and uh, finding the bad guys and destroying the demons and things. And um, her kind of sidekick uh sexual tension is jake timber uh who is south african and um uh, you know he that they, they work together as partners and uh although jake's had his own outing recently in uh, one day in new york uh so obviously with another woman <laughs> and um yeah so that's really fun and um that is a kind of episodic series so there's seven books now in each book there's like a new a uh, new mystery to solve, um, and that's what they they basically do. So each book can be standalone, but also it's a sort of ongoing series. Um, and then the London Psychic is I'm now calling it a trilogy because there's three books: um, yes. Desecration, Delirium, and Deviance. And it's it's more kind of a Stephen King kind of a darker um, crime thriller. So there is a detective, an actual British detective, who um, teams up with a, a psychic who works at the British Museum, Blake. And I call him a reluctant psychic because, you know, he doesn't really advertise the fact that he has these um, this gift. And he said he can touch objects and read the past and have kind of visions of what, where that object has been and what happened so in um in day of the vikings he actually teams up with morgan and he he looks back and sees the viking sort of invasion of britain and things so it's a lot of fun um and i get to indulge my research junkiness and i put i put all my travels in the book and um yeah i mean i love it so that's that they the, the Arcane series is very much more, you know, kind of high-octane, uh, fast-paced, action-adventure, fun, blowing stuff up. And The London Psychic is slightly slower-paced um, mystery. Yeah. I, I've uh, read the first two or, or done the audiobooks of, of the first two of The London Psychic uh, Crime Thriller. And of course, uh, Blake Daniel is my favourite character. <laughs> I was like, oh, I, I just love this guy. And um, <laughs> I'm so glad you said more. that. What was funny, of course, was I um I started writing with Jamie Brooke, the detective in mind, uh, the female character. And then Blake, and it was meant to be a straight crime novel. There was not meant to be any supernatural side. And then Blake kind of popped up into my head. And, and immediately I am so much more into Blake than Jamie. Um, and it's, yeah. well, you, can put, you <laughs> clearly can tell. <laughs> Well, in the second book, I was less like, oh, my gosh, his history and um, how he 
he kind of suffered and you really, after you've been through the first book and the second book, you start to really feel for him and know why he is the way he is. And that, that was quite impactful for me as a, as a, a listener and a reader of the actual story. So I was, I was like, oh, I love Blake. Aww. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love Blake. Really really please. <laughs> and, well, the thing is, and, and this is kind of why I've ended it as a trilogy, but I haven't ended a Blake. Um, so in the third book, I, you know, no real spoilers, but he doesn't die. So basically I can, yeah, I, I have got some plans for other stories for Blake, but, you know, his and Jamie's kind of arc is is nicely rounded out yeah. in that third book. And I'll let you know when the audio when oh, the audio is ready. Because, you know, I like both. I do the reading and I love to listen to the audio as well because it gives it just something a little bit more, a little bit rich. It enriches the experience for me. I think I must be auditory mm. as well. So, <laughs> so can you explain why you write under J.F. Penn for your thrillers as opposed to Joanna Penn as a name? Uh, well, two two reasons. I started off with Joanna Penn with fiction, and I had my initial reviews with things like, uh, how can such a nice, smiley um, woman write, um, you know, death scenes and explosions and action adventure? And I was like, oh, that's not great, you know, because I am this nice, smiley person, but my shadow side is is a right you know, kills people, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and so, and I didn't want to be judged for my gender. There's also evidence that men in particular, well, men, only men, women will buy books by either gender. Men will generally buy books by men. Mm. So, and they, the, the name Joanna is clearly female. So I decided to initially go with JF Penn in order to get rid of the gender issue. Mm. Um, I am a feminist, I absolutely, you know, and it's not to hide my gender, it's to make it gender neutral. And like J.K. Rowling has done that. Lots of women write under um, initials in male-dominated categories, like sci-fi, you'll see the same type of thing. Uh, And in my niche, action-adventure is very male-dominated, like Clive Cussler, James Rollins, you know, Steve Berry, that type of name. Very, well, I can't even think of a woman who's big in that niche. Um, So I decided to do it for that reason. The second reason, which has kind of turned out to be really good, is that my as my brands have grown, um, Joanna Penn and the Creative Penn, the audience is authors. Um, so, and most people, ninety five percent of people who come to my site, the Creative Penn, will not buy my fiction. So, you know, you're you're unusual in that regard. Um, you know that you've actually read or listened to stuff. But most people, you know, say a romance writer comes to the Creative Penn, they can still get loads of stuff from the site. They don't need to read my thrillers. Um, so. JFPen.com as a separate site has a completely different audience Mm. and what I like about having the two brands is that it helps me with everything it helps me with scheduling so in my diary I have JF Pen time and Joanna Pen time so depending on which business I'm working on I separate my email list I have a different color scheme you know I have a different photo the whole thing just helps me separate the two brands and um, is very useful in that segmentation of audience. Uh, yeah, so I would really recommend it only if your audience is different. Mm-hmm. Obviously, when if you're writing erotica and children's books, mm-hmm. you need a separate yes. brand. Yeah. You could definitely get... I could definitely have got away with using the same name, and a lot of writers do. Um, Dean Wesley Smith is an example. He uses the same name. Um, there's lots of people who use the same name. Um, Chuck Wendig would be another example Um, but for me I'm really happy to actually have these two separate brands Um, and I think it it works if you want to separate them like I have yeah yeah Um, so I wanted to also delve into a little bit more about how you came up with your specific main characters like uh, James Mm. Detective Sergeant Jamie Brooke (laughs) I've got to get that right. And Dr. Morgan Sierra, you've already said she's your alter ego. And um, I, I'm really interested in how you've done the crime investigation and the mystery and did you interview detectives? How did you come to this? <laughs> yeah, well, Morgan 
when I started writing the Arcane series, the first book, I did envision a series character, um, so a kind of in, an agent type character who would be a recurring, so I could write lots of books in a series, because that they're the type of books I like writing as well. And Morgan, you know, it starts off at Oxford, and I went to Oxford, and she specialises in psychology, religion, which I did, and she travels a lot. She is, she was brought up in Israel, which I wasn't. I mean, there's, there's lots of things about her that are me, and lots of things that aren't. Um, she has a twin sister I don't um, you know but she has like long dark hair and uh, but she does amazing craft my god this is really martial art and I just I run away crying at the- <laughs> if somebody tries to hit me I'm like hmm. so she she's like what I would you know my kind of badass alter ego and I would love to look that good and you know like leather jackets and stuff but um so you know like a fantasy version of me like Lara Croft kind of thing um so Morgan fulfills the need in me to have that adventure side um and it, like my husband says um sometimes it's like oh does, does morgan need an adventure trip to you know go shooting or you know just does morgan need to go drive a fast car today or something you know because he's he's like that's the side of me that wants to go do this fun research um and then with jamie but i think because i'd already exercised that kind of need to create me in a in a book um jamie i had just decided to write a different novel I wanted to test myself creatively I I didn't want to only write the arcane books so I was like okay I need a new character and in Britain particularly in Britain the crime novels are very popular so I thought I'll I'll write a crime novel because I like reading crime um so to be fair I just did my research on the internet (laughs) I do have a coroner who helps me with dead bodies and he answers questions on like what do dead bodies look like he actually well, I haven't got them handy but he sent me some toe tags the other way other day <laughs> like the toe tags yeah, from yeah, the morgue that yeah, on bodies yeah. <laughs> we have weird friends um but um but other than that I mainly I do all my research either in person like going to places uh, and all the places in the London Psychic series are actual places in London and I'm actually going to do a map that people can download for free and like have a look at all the pictures and stuff uh but yeah with Jamie and I mean her her at the beginning of the first book her daughter is um very sick and uh so and I don't have children and I've had so many emails by people from people who said oh wow you know I'm sorry for your loss uh you know for me and I'm like no I'm a, I'm a fiction writer you know just just as the way that the sex we might write or the killing that we might write is made up you know so so is the emotional resonance so a lot of this stuff I'm sure you you know because you're a writer a lot of this stuff just arrives and you just write it down mm. and you know like Blake like you're saying with Blake I didn't you know I just and in my mind he was always mixed race yeah. um he's half half Nigerian half Swedish and I was like he has to be mixed race and that that's London for me and London is mixed race and I love that so these things just kind of arrive and then you write them down and I have another series in mind um and at the moment, it's funny, I'm trying to decide whether the main character is male or female. And that's quite a big deal, you know, coming up with that. Mm-hmm. And then we'll see what happens. <laughs> oh, how exciting. Um, because I was, uh, uh, I'm interested because I was wondering how do you plot your, your uh, mystery beats into the crime thrillers in particular? Because I've heard you talk about you need to know the ending. I'd really like you mm. to walk us through how you do that. Uh, well, Scrivener. Mm. Scrivener is how you do that. So for me, I know the beginning. I always have, I know the opening scene, so I'll know that, you know, there's a body. There's, there's some kind of something's happened. And then I, what I do is I write down the questions that come up as a result of that. So it's like, okay, who is the dead body? Uh, who killed them? Why did they kill them? Who finds the body? Who is investigating? Uh, what are, what are, what are this driving them? What does the main character want to achieve, which is usually finding the murderer? Um, so you have these questions that you know then you need to ask. And then I know the ending, so I know... And for me, for me, it's always a struggle between good and evil. That's the type of yep. the emotional thing I do at the end of all my books. So I know the ending, and it has to be somewhere dramatic. So I'm like, okay, I know that's the ending. 
then it's like, okay, how do we get from here to here? With a mystery, particularly, you have to put in either red herrings or misdirection or possible other people it could be. So you have to kind of just put those in. And I just use Scrivener. I mean, I don't pl- plot very much at all. I just use Scrivener to put in, like, one-liners by scene. And, you know, so it would be like um, Jamie interviews Magda, uh, who's in the third book um, or Jamie goes to see O at the Torture Garden nightclub which you know is in book one and uh, you know it's a fascinating yes. place yes um, yeah we should say it's a, fet- a sex fetish club rather than an actual torture garden <laughs> Cool, cool. But um, you know these, and and I get, I come up with the, I often come up with settings for these things because I find the settings interesting, and so and also for me it's about themes. So I have themes like desecration. The theme is very much the physical body. So it's like okay, well, and I wrote down a whole load of things about the physical body. So tattooing and body modification whilst you're alive, and the specimens that go in jars when you're dead, and what happens to your body when you die. And really interesting questions that have to go. <laughs> It's a, it's a story, but you can put in these other things. I'm probably not making much sense, but to me, seriously, all I do is open a Scrivener document and I chuck all of this stuff in it. Mm-hmm. And it might be all over the place, but then what's magic and what maybe hasn't dropped for you yet is if you're writing, if you're writing something later on, you just go back and put stuff in earlier. So, for example, oh, you haven't read... Um, Deviance is fresh in my mind because I've just... uh, I'll use it as an example. So there's one bit where we want to identify a particular bad guy. And I'm like, how how do we drop in a clue earlier on that the reader later recognises? And I decided to use a a particular pen with a a distinctive fox head. So um, I put the head, the, the pen, earlier on in the book. Now, I only got to that when I'd written about... 85% 85% of the book mm. Mm. but I then just nip back earlier and put that in mm. so then that enables you to link oh, that okay. in the reader's yeah. mind yeah. so there's an that. awful lot yeah. of that when you're writing a mystery mm. you have to keep going back and adding stuff in mm. Mm. wow that's that's amazing because uh, I have been thinking about that but it's so nice to hear somebody else <laughs> talk, say how you do it <laughs> well, you wonder the, if you're the on the te- right track <laughs> Yeah, no, and the, the technical name for that is foreshadowing. Oh, okay, great. So um, how uh, you've, you've mentioned your settings are important to you uh, and you love to travel, so how important is the setting to your characters and how do they grow out of your setting? Uh, I'm, I always start with setting really um, – yeah I mean I like the London's like Blake came out of London um and in a sense Morgan came out of Jerusalem and Oxford you know two places I'm very attached to and appear in so many of my books um but yeah for me the setting uh, gives rise to a story so for example my husband and I went to Budapest and visited the, the mass grave there in the ghetto and uh I wrote we spent four days in Budapest and I ended up writing one day in Budapest which is about the rise of the right wing um uh, and it's based on truth and uh, you know the right wing government in in um Hungary is you know it's, it's awful I mean there's this terrible stuff going on in 20 15 and I just had to write about it so for me that whole story came out of a visit to Budapest and there's a particularly kind of awful um it's called the the shoe the shoes along the shoes on the Danube and it's just a, this a whole line of shoes uh, in metal all along the banks of the Danube. And uh, it's where um, the, the fascists lined up a whole load of Jews and shot them. And But they told them to take their shoes off first. So they've got these shoes there. And we visited it. And I was just like, oh, you know, for me, that's like visually, you can see it in your head. Like, can't you? A whole load of metal shoes on the side of a fast flowing river. And I was like, this, this has to go in the book. And uh, there is a scene, you know, where I use that in the book. And everywhere we went uh, that weekend it is in the book. So absolutely setting for me is so important and also I'm a travel addict so um you know I always use the excuse of writing a book to actually do that like I have um, a story I want to write about a particular group of Japanese monks and so I'm like we have to plan our trip to Japan so I can write this story because I would feel bad if we wrote it without 
having, having visited, visited. Yeah. <laughs> said <Absolutely>. monks. <laughs> I have to tell you, as a, a fan of your writing, I um, that first book, uh, the ending of it, the climax. I won't give any spoilers away, but that's a moment uh, with the little girl that I I often revisit in my mind. It's bizarre, kind of like walking to work, and I think about that, and it's just about the that theme about desecration and humanity and what is sacred and what's not and it's just something that continues to come up for me and I think a lot about that and it's interesting that our fiction work can affect people so deeply and I think it's a um it's very nice to know that as a writer you've you've allowed me to connect into with something so profound really so yeah oh I, 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 I love you <laughs> That's, that's the effect, you know, and, of course, I was crying on the train and all these sorts of things. Oh, good, I made you cry. Do you know, so, I mean, I say that's good. It, I think it is good because I cried when I wrote the scene that I presume you're thinking about, and I was like, it was, it, it's the only time I've cried while writing, and I think that's part of trying to tap into what it would feel like to go through that. But I'm so glad you thought about those top themes. Yeah. For me, the other thing about spending time writing, and absolutely people should write just for money if they want to, Mm. absolutely. But for me, I want to write to figure out what I think Mm. about things. Mm. So desecration, I walked into that Hunterian Museum. It stems from a physical reaction I had to body parts in jars. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why do I feel so weirded out by this I know these are not living people anymore you know why is it so weird so and that made me investigate why we feel that way and I mean that that series like you know we've discussed is quite deep and meaningful underlying the just the story but for me I can't I it's almost like I can't decide what I think about something unless I write a book about it you know what I mean and for me that's that's the journey for a creative you know once you've learned to write how to write a book every book you write has to be something new for you the writer as well yeah yeah so no you you really made my you've made my day saying that I really appreciate that because it's very hard to let you know how much it it, it really deeply affects you in a positive I think in a very positive way and makes you think about the realities of of life and um although you're escaping from life you're actually experiencing a new part of life through those characters and for Mm. me it was very profound I yeah thoroughly enjoyed it and at that moment, I was like, oh, my gosh, where did she go with these dark moments? <laughs> but they're very cool and people need to read your stuff <laughs> or get it on audio, I have to say, because audio is great as well. So the other thing I wanted to ask about was how do you decide on your treatment for your novels, you know, a third person versus first person point of view? Uh, I, ha- I just use what is the norm in my genre which is third person um and different chapters for different characters so that is the thriller genre um so I would really just advise you to model a book so what I did one of the things I did when I was writing the first book is I got um I can't remember the name of it now anyway James Rollins thriller I think it was the doomsday key I've still got a spreadsheet so what I did with this book so I got a spreadsheet. I had, you know, first word, how many um, words in the chapter, uh, last line, you know, first line, last line, how many words in the chapter, point of view, um, what did we learn in the chapter, you know, how did the stuff move? And I just did a spreadsheet of the whole book, breaking down the whole book. And through doing that, I learned how to write a thriller. It was like, okay, it has short chapters. It, ha- it goes from you cut away. This character never has two chapters chapters in a row you know there's always a cutaway this is the last line it's always a cliffhangery type line the first line hooks you into the new chapter introduces the new characters you know so you know you're in the head of somebody else so essentially you can just learn that by deconstructing any book that uh, you like that is in your genre so and they're totally genre things so if you're writing a YA dystopian novel 
it better be in first person and it better be a female protagonist of, of a YA age. And romance, for example, many best-selling romance books, they're all in first person. So really, because then you're feeling what you're meant to feel. So the, these things can make a big difference. I haven't, I've written one short story in first person so far. It is something I'm thinking about for other things. But in my genre, it's very much a third person so that you can jump to the bad guy. Thrillers are not about... See, that's the difference between the two series. You know, thrillers, you know who the bad guy is and you need to stop them. Mm. And in a mystery, you, you it's kind of find out who did it type mm. of thing. Mm. So with thrillers, you almost need to go see the bad guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to actually, with the thrillers where you talk about your shadow side, how... Did you have any trouble allowing yourself to write that dark side at all? Oh yeah, and I've got a lot. I've got a video on this on the fear of judgment. Mm. Um, it's on YouTube. You can have a look. Um, I'll, I'll, it's just I'll called Have a look for it. Fear, yeah, fear of judgment. Something. Um, yeah, it took that. Desecration was my fifth book, and it took me until that book to start writing the things that were in my head that uh, I was afraid to write before that. And now, uh, and then Stephen Pressfield, who I recommend, you know, The War of Art, Turning Pro, you know, he said to not, to not write what's in your head is disrespectful to the muse. And if you're disrespectful to the muse, she might not come over anymore. Um, And I was like, okay, I better respect the muse then. And now I do write what I, what comes into my head. Um, I won't write, I won't write things that might hurt people. Mm. You know, I write fiction, um, mm. yeah. and um, so I'm. But I make sure that I would never hurt somebody by inadvertently mentioning something that might have happened with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but other than that, yes, I write the dark side. Um, the dark side of things, like desecration, does have that edge of horror. Mm. It's not a horror novel. I mean, you know, it's not it's not horror, but it does have an edge of of darkness um, that some people find a bit much. <laughs> but that's you know, for me, I need. That's why I did it as a different series as well. The Arcane series, you know, I don't think is that is that dark. It's actually pretty fun. Um, so yeah, you have to find decide what you want to write. I mean, like erotica. Most erotica writers write under a pseudonym because they're writing sex and they don't want their mother-in-law to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I think I've come up against it myself. It's like this fear of want, wanting to write something and going, well, what would somebody think and make of that? And, and yeah. feeling and, like that would reflect on me as a writer and instead of them actually enjoying the experience of being in this with the characters. And I was just wondering. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say that it's not a fear of, it reflecting on you as a writer I think it's more of a fear of it reflecting on you as a person Mm. so it's like I am a nice person Mm. and some people by reading what I write might think I'm a horrible person Mm. or might think I'm a bit weird or (laughs) you know and my mum you know my mum said um why don't you write something oh no I think it was my mother-in-law you know why don't you write something nicer something happier and my mum said why don't you write something like Hilary Mantel who was a historical fiction award-winning literary novelist and no one's ever gonna your readers are not your the people who know you Mm, you know like you like you said I've connected with you over desecration and none of my family or friends have felt the same way so you understand me more in that way than they do yeah 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 and that's that's a really good point (laughs) well thank you and that's that's the important thing you're you've got to think my readers might be in india or japan or you know you might never ever know who they are but you'll touch them so yeah try and be honest or at least wait till book number five and then let it rip (laughs) i will I'll get there. Okay, well, we'll move on to the creative pen. Um, obviously, you sort of said how it came about. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your non-fiction books for authors that are looking to create a career in writing? Yeah, sure. So um, I've got 
a book called How to Market a Book, which is does what it says on the box. In fact, all my books do what they say on the box. So business for authors, how to make a living with your writing. And then I've got one on public speaking for authors and creatives and other introverts. And um, the blog has, you know, I post on the blog uh, a lot. And I have a YouTube channel and a podcast and Twitter feed. And I mean, essentially everything I learn as a writer, I put out there on my site in some way. Um, and most of it's free, like 99% and my stuff is available for free so um i have the author 2.0 blueprint that people can download for free which is you know everything i know about self-publishing and marketing books and all that so i think the main thing is that we're in this very fast-paced fast-changing world right now where with and i call it that you know it's part of the maker movement that people are more and more doing their own thing creating things selling things online and it so everything i learn as i learn it i put up there to help people along the way um and my non-fiction books are just part of that really but um yeah i mean i think you can find stuff there at any point in your journey whether you're writing your first book or wanting to actually make a six-figure income with your writing and i hope that people will find um everything they need there I know it was invaluable for me, so you know it, it really helped me to find some key people as well to help me with my writing journey. So mm. It's uh, you just never know. I say YouTube it, <laughs> iTunes it, anything. <laughs> get on, get onto the creativepen dot com. Um, so with your public speaking too, like how did you handle overcoming your introvert side to be a public speaker as a part of this business? <laughs> Yeah, well, (laughs) introversion is one kind of scale and introversion just means that you get your energy from being alone and then shy, not shy is an entirely other scale. So I am an introvert, but I'm not shy. So for me, I'm... I can, you know, I learned professional speaking and everything's in the book is a massive topic. Um, but, and I'm a paid professional speaker, but I can only do it occasionally. So, you know, maybe once a month because it's very tiring for me and I need to, uh, you know, get my energy back by being alone. So, um, yeah, it's more about managing your energy and especially if you're doing a day job, it can be very hard to do a day job and write and speak. So speaking is one of the things that I put into my business early as a waiter. It's a good way to earn kind of spike income. It's not an ongoing thing because it's paid it's paid for your time. Uh, so again, that's another reason to only do a little bit. But it's um, I really enjoy speaking and I think you know it's another way to reach people and help people. Um, but I just have to manage my energy really. Just before we go, I'd like to know, uh, what are you working on now? Can you share any secrets with us? (laughs) um well i in terms of non-fiction i'm working on a book about mindsets so you mentioned fear of judgment that will definitely be a section in the book um the sort of psychology of of being a writer and going through what we do uh so i'm working on that i'm also working on um the creative freedom course which will be my kind of community for people who want to make a living with their writing and for my fiction I'm um about I'm starting in three weeks time I'm starting Risen Gods which is a new book uh set in New Zealand um yeah with a co-writing with Jay Thorne who is um yeah yeah he's he is a horror writer but we're actually it's this is going to be more of a sort of post-apocalyptic dark fantasy um thing so definitely the first books in new zealand and we're we're talking about potentially a second book being in australia Ooh, so you know exciting. set in australia <laughs> exciting yeah so yeah so that's a real um that this is going to be my first co-writing experience and i'm a little nervous about it but i believe it's important for us to keep pushing ourselves creatively and um as james patterson says who co-writes a lot he said you know all you need to know is lennon and mccartney you know if you think lennon and mccartney you can understand that two creatives can do better than one so why not give it a go so that's i'm not saying that me and jay thorne will be like lennon and mccartney but you know what I mean? It's, yeah. So that's um, that's what's coming up. Oh, and also I'm I'm plotting out Destroyer of Worlds, which will be Arcane number eight. So I'm busy, you know? Yeah, you are. Okay, well, thank you so much. Can you tell us where people can find you and your books online? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, all my books are, uh, you know, ebook, print book, and many of them in audio book on all of the big stores. So, you know, Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, Nook, etc. Um, also, my website's thecreativepen.com, pen with a double N, and jfpen.com, and on Twitter at the Creative Pen. Thank you so much for your time today, Joanna. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me on, Selena. Bye bye.